Uh, so I, uh, this is Nick Gillespie. This is the Reason live stream. I'm joined today by my Reason colleague, Natalie Dozicki. Hi, Natalie. Hey, happy to be here. Is, is it Dozicki or Dowzicki? Dowzicki. You're Dow-Zicki. close. <laughs> okay, yeah, close enough for, uh, for anti-government work. And we're joined by Eli Lake, uh, who is calling in from an undisclosed, undisclosed location. Uh, hello, Eli. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Nick. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, I want to point out at the uh, beginning that Natalie and you are both from uh, the Philadelphia area. And so, you know, we'll factor that into, uh, you know, your- Go Birds. Okay. (laughs) Where are you from? Um, I'm from Germantown. I'm I'm from outside King of Prussia. Oh. Oh, oh my God. Then you're not, I mean, that's like Harrisburg, right? (laughs) I thought you were actually from Philadelphia. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, yes. No. Um, okay. So we are uh, this uh, today. Uh, we are doing a uh, live stream conversation for about the next hour, and we're it's going to revolve around Kanye West, who uh, is um, you know one of the greatest musical artists, arguably a major player in fashion and particularly in streetwear, but definitely a major major recording artist who has a bizarre history of both challenging the conventional wisdom, uh, particularly when it comes to racial and political matters, uh, but also has a history of mental illness, uh, which he's talked about openly. He's bipolar, uh, and he actually absented himself from uh, social media for the better part of two years, I think, right, or 18 months, uh, not too long ago because of that. He's also, he was married to Kim Kardashian, in which, you know, I hate to put anything in terms of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, but like it was as big a deal as that, um, you know, was in its day. Um, but we're going to talk about that. I guess, first off, uh, Eli, can you are uh, you are the host of the Reeducation podcast, yes. uh, which is mostly about politics, but off, also you talk about popular culture, including music. You are uh, known to uh, freestyle rap. We're going to put a moratorium on that uh, <laughs> for the next hour. What you do on your own business is, you know, is your, you know, you can do whatever you want. But um, how big a deal is Kanye West as a, as a musician? Well, I think you have to, he's in the category in my <clears> view, he, he turned himself into a serious rapper, but that's not really where his genius is. He's more of a kind of musical visionary. Um, And in that respect, he's more than a producer when you consider the breakthrough of the the precedent that he set on albums like My Dark Twisted Beautiful Fantasy, which is kind of like, you could say hip hop's, you know, Sgt. Pepper or Abbey Road. Um, Except that it's something we would actually want to listen to from time to time. (laughs) You're, don't slander Abbey Road. I, I, I'm, I'm here for part uh, of this. Yeah, okay. okay. Mean okay. Mr. Mustard. Yeah. Uh, right. The whole thing. Um, but then, you, you know, there's an album that didn't do as well, but it's called it's mm-hmm. called 808 and Heartbreaks. That was a record that kind of invented Drake's, a half of Drake's sound, the kind of emo, um, heavily mm-hmm. modified, synthesized singing that he does on a lot of his work. Um, and that was a kind of, that was... That was Kanye West coming up with that mm-hmm. you know, before anybody else, and in that and and the and the fact that he has not limited himself just to hip hop, he put out yeah. I think some excellent gospel records recently, um, and you know he's a he's a towering figure not as again not just as a producer, but I, I like to think of him sort of as a musical visionary. He has and he's also somebody who's found talent. Um, you know some of the first yeah. guest appearances of Big Sean. Nicki Minaj was, you know, with Young Money, but you know her breakout was on a Kanye West single. Um, you know, so in that respect, he's a, he is a huge and enormous figure. Um, and I, I'm I'm trying to think if there would be an equivalent, uh, you know, in other things. But you know, in that, respect, I mean, maybe like a, a David Bowie type on some level. I mean, it, it, they're I all so. distinct. But you know, where Bowie not only changed the musical landscape for what he did, but then broke a lot of talent or you know produced people and brought them to larger audiences and really yeah, kind and of just re- shifted the, the, the rest- musical conversation yeah, absolutely and the restlessness of kanye to constantly change style so when he came out with a record called yeezus it was almost mm-hmm. like industrial you know it was it was yeah. very gritty it wasn't really like a popular hip-hop record it was certainly not like anything right. else that was coming out before it from him or in the in the sense so he the restlessness the fact that he's always trying out new styles that was very yeah. Bowie-esque 
in that respect. So, uh, Natalie, do you have strong feelings about uh, Kanye or as I guess he's yay or ye? He's ye now, right? I don't know how to pronounce it. Who knows? It's hard. (laughs) But um, do you have strong, uh, strong sensibility about him? I mean, as a as an artist and uh, well, as a musician and as an artist and as like a cultural icon, like we like we've already hinted at, I think it's it's hard because the Kanye like I know and love or the the ye that um, mm-hmm. I know and love is like from the stronger album. And so like, <laughs> and th- like his song stronger just like was such a cultural impact when I was like younger and like when I, I was in college or high school. And that's kind of what I, he's like always stuck in my brain as, as that musician, yeah. which is like, it's great to see musicians evolve like this, what we've already talked about, but like, I, I kind of miss, that version of him uh, but maybe that's just like for my my musical preference um, right but more so than anything else <laughs> and if i'm i'm gonna flip the cards you're 26 right i am yeah so I am. you i mean but you know it's distinct uh because i'm much older than that i am uh 20 years uh, 22 years older 23 years older than you so i grew up in the rock era and um you are a hip-hop native eli is is a good bit uh, he's somewhere in in the middle of us um but it's kind of fascinating to think about this conversation just about popular music eli you know when you i know you like hip-hop you like rap you've kind of evolved into that for me, my kids do, but it's a little bit distant. But I recognize the cultural force that somebody like well, I grew, I grew up with it. I mean, I was I was like in elementary school when the first rap records really started coming out in Philadelphia. So I, I yeah. from a very young age, I used to listen to Lady B's program on Power ninety nine when hip hop wasn't played on any other radio stations except yep. for this one time slot on Sundays. Um, so please I, tell I, me I, that you hung out with Jazzy Jeff. I wish in I West Philadelphia, Jeff, but I remember when I West remember Philadelphia, when I was born and raised. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I will say this when I was an intern at Philadelphia magazine many years ago, I did one of yeah. the first interviews with Quest Love when he was with mm. what they were then calling themselves the square roots before they were the roots. And they had a local pressed album called Organics, which is terrific if you can find it. Um, the first it was right. It was before their first major label. Uh, release of Do You Want More? But I mean, the roots were fantastic uh, in this, yeah. you know, so Philadelphia has a rich tradition. But yeah, on in terms of Kanye, there's not really much like him. He's had several mm-hmm. careers because he was a really important, de- um, he was an important producer for Jay-Z in his later works, you know, like yeah. he's all over the album, the Black album and the Blueprint. Those are really important hip hop records, and if it was just if, if it was if he was just the producer who did that and other things, and worked with like diplomats and Ca- Cameron and things like that, mm-hmm. you know, Dieno. But then he decided he had to be a rapper. He wanted to be an, a star, and he kind of willed himself into this position. And and then you know, as I said, he he becomes kind of musical visionary, and is gone beyond hip hop. It's, it's it's he's bigger than just a hip hop artist at this point, in my view. He's bigger than the Beatles were when they were bigger than Jesus. Well, I don't know about that. The Beatles were <laughs> yeah. popular, okay. I, I just want to say this. I don't know about that. Jesus was really yeah. big, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, not in his lifetime, though. You know, no, he, not uh, his, no, Jesus, he Jesus is it. like Nick Drake or something. You know, he's much bigger after <laughs> he died. Um, like so yeah. let's, uh, we have a couple of clips, but the reason we're talking about Kanye West is, you know, I mean, he's, he's famous because of his music. Uh, somewhat because of his dabbling in, in fashion and whatnot, and, and for marrying Kim Kardashian, who is kind of a fascinating cultural force in her own. And I like to think of these people as all kind of broadly libertarian in the sense that they are highly individualistic in a culture that oftentimes is antagonistic to that. And they, you know, they make, they have their reality distortion fields that are, you know, pretty amazing to think about. Um, but without you know trying to layer too much ideology onto any of this Kanye recently gave a an interview to uh, to Tucker Carlson on Fox News where he talked about a lot of things and we're going to get to the comments where he uh, both uh, on his social media accounts as well as in unaired versions of the uh, of the Tucker Carlson interview that um, came to light through Vice Uh, where he ranges into anti-Semitism of a particularly kind of classic version within the black community. Um, We're going to talk about that, but let's play a clip first, uh, Natalie. Uh, Would you uh, uh, lay 
uh, start the uh, Trump clip from drove the Tucker me Carlson crazy interview. to not be able to say that I like Trump. It drove because think about it, it's me. Imagine me not being able to say what I wanted. What was the point of being famous? What was the point of having you know millions of people love your music? What was the point of having a voice? If you can't even use your own voice and connect it to your own opinions. Yes. <laughs> That's where the disconnect happened. That's where the. OK, so I, I you know, by the way, Tucker Carlson, I don't know. Uh, you know, I know him a bit personally. I used to be on his old MSNBC show a while. Uh, he is an incredible performer, whatever you think about him. He uh, and staging this. And it's interesting when you look at what he left out. And what he left in, because it's a long, like two hour, uh, you know, two part interview with Kanye West. And he left out the good parts, right, in many ways, like the most incendiary stuff. But let's focus first on this snippet. Um, and it recalls a while ago, uh, you know, when Trump emerged as a political figure, Kanye West was kind of friendly to him. He actually showed up. He wore a MAGA hat and whatnot. Um, and then he kind of went silent. How do you how do you respond to him talking about a kind of orthodoxy in the entertainment industry in Hollywood, as it were, um, that kept him silent, Eli? Well, in some ways, Kanye's attitude towards Trump after he wins the election in 2016 is the same as a lot of Hollywood's reaction to Trump 10 years before that. Trump, I mean, there's a song by uh, Morris Day in the Time mm -hmm. called the Donald Trump Black Version, which is a pion to Trump when he was the real estate mogul guy. Uh, and this was a song from like the very end of the 80s. Um, there, you can watch Comedy Central Roast of Donald Trump and you'll find all of these celebrities who, you know, they're needling him, but he's part of the club. And that, you know, when Donald Trump was a, kind of not seen as a political threat and just a celebrity, he gave money to like lots of Democrats who ended up you know, hating him. He was a, he was somebody who was sort of accepted as fine. He was in the club. He's a rich guy, kind of a celebrity and everything else. Um, then, you know, when he takes on this kind of very angry populist tone and is becomes the kind of, you know, uh, wrecking ball of the political establishment is when. Trump in this period, and, and some of it is earned, he becomes toxic. Now, I think Kanye in some ways is looking around. He's saying there are all these things that now that I'm like in this sort of elite club and that he, I think he, there's something about him as an artist that he wants to kind of touch whatever the third rail is because he realizes that whatever people are telling you, whatever yeah. the shibboleth is that you, you can never, you know, expose or never say, that's probably where the art is going to be. So I sort of see him that way. We talked about this on, on when you were a guest with me on punk rock, but Kanye in a lot of ways is embodying the spirit of punk from the mid, from 1975, right. 1976, in that he's whatever it is that is this sacred cow in our culture that you're not allowed to talk about and you're not allowed to like, he's coming out there and like, you know, making sure that you know that he's on the other side of it. And that to me, it's, and so that's where I think that's coming from. So yeah, he doesn't want to be told what to think and who he supports. That's all well and good. But part of that is very deliberate because that's how Kanye kind of sees himself. He's right. going to figure out like when he started just to kind of put a circle on this. One of the things he fashion wise he did when he when he came out with College Dropout, his first record, is that he deliberately dressed in like Carlton of the Fresh Prince, like mm -hmm. very preppy, you know, sweater vests, Argyle. And the reason he did that is because everybody else in hip hop was wearing baggy jeans and hoodies and everything else like that. So. Yeah. His point was like, you know, I, whatever you, when, when you zig, I'm going to zag and I'm going to do that deliberately. And it's, I mean, it's interesting to think about when he first, you know, he, uh, this was a few years ago, but it was wrapped up in the Trump stuff where he was saying that, uh, you know, he intimated that slavery was a choice in, in a kind of strange interview uh, that was very electrifying. And he basically was arguing and echoing something Trump had said, which was that, African-American voters were being taken uh, for granted by the Democratic Party or by liberals uh, who had not served them very well. And this was a Trump talking point on the campaign trail. Uh, a, uh, a Kanye protege, Chance the Rapper, got into big trouble when he said, you know what, like, uh, you know, when you look at the way the police and the schools 
are run in Chicago, his home city, you know, we shouldn't be voting for Democrats. And he ended up walking that back. Um, so there's that kind of antinomianism of pushing back. I guess, Natalie, well, is that... I was I was going to yeah, say, too, like, this is someone who has always been known for, like, not wanting to follow the script, right? So, like, right. I don't think this, like, is necessarily surprising. Like, him being, uh, liking Trump isn't, like, a surprising, like, turn of events, as right. I think, like, people seem to be very surprised in 2018. Like, this is someone who's, like, very much tries to fight the narrative. He's mm -hmm. He's been in the spotlight his whole life. Um, and, and even more so in the last decade because of um, his very public family and very public, mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess now technically divorced, maybe not, uh, uh, marriage. But I think part of it too is like, I think it was back in 2005 or, uh, he said something about like George W. Bush, right. not caring, not caring about yeah. black people right. um, because of like the plans. And, and yeah, I mean, it's remember, this is the same guy who like shouldered, uh, uh, Taylor Swift, off right. the stage at an award ceremony, kind of like the way that Black Lives activists shouldered Bernie Sanders off the stage at a campaign event in 2016. Yeah. Uh, continue, Natalie. Yeah, and he's just always been someone that's like tr been provocative, right? And I think yeah. if if that's like his that's his mo, and that's always been his mo. So from the Trump from his perspective on Trump, that's not all that surprising. Um, but I do think like after learning about like the mental health struggles he could be having or has been having for quite some time. Um, it makes him a little bit more, um, even more controversial, I would say, um, because there, there are now two camps that want to dismiss, dismiss what he says entirely because of um, his mental illness. He came out, I believe it was in 2018, he, um, and uh, told everyone that he was bipolar. Um, so everyone kind of just uses that now to discount a lot of the quote unquote crazy or crazy stuff you said since then. Um, so can I add, the, or can I ask yeah. you, you know, what's interesting, uh, you know, and in these moments, he reminds me even more than of David Bowie, uh, Bob, uh, Bob Dylan, of like, you know, Dylan in the, you know, at various points, you know, turns on his audience, or, you know, it's widely interpreted as turning on his audience. First folk rockers, he goes electric. I think the most amazing one was, you know, at the end of the 70s, the me decade, a decade of, you know, swinging and sex parties. He becomes a born again Christian in no uncertain terms. Kanye West is kind of doing that. Um, so there's that. But then the, the question, Natalie and Eli, is why didn't he speak up sooner? Because if he thrives on telling people to go fuck themselves, why was he silent for so long? That's that's I the mean, mystery, it's, it's, in it? the interview, he seemed to be suggesting that he was getting threat, like, like threats of violence, um, especially like from close, like friends of his. By um, from Chris Kardashian. I mean, yeah. what does that even mean? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> apparently she has a lot of a lot of power. I don't keep up yeah. with them, but, you know, um, I think I think he was more intimidated, which is also confusing because he didn't really seem as someone that could be easily intimidated. Um, but I think too, like there's a, there's a large aspect too with his kids getting involved in like his drama. And I think um, from the Carlson interview, like, like you said, it ran, it ran two hours plus because we got unedited versions as well. Um, and I think it, he seemed to be worried about like his, his kids. Cause those came up multiple times. Like he was worried about coming out in support of Trump in fear of like the retaliation against him against him and his career being over um quote unquote but also like what would happen like retaliation against his children um do you so think that explains his silence eli like i don't know um I, it's possible i think it's it, it's a reflection of it, it, i don't i think the world was very different in 2005 after hurricane katrina when he said george w bush doesn't like uh black people and that it was you know hollywood was liberal and George W. Bush wasn't popular with, you know, a lot of people in the music industry. But it was it didn't feel like it was really <laughs> who like, was was he popular with anyone? I mean, maybe yes, like Dave was. Mustaine of Megadeth or something. But I mean, no, no, I, he, was, I, he was popular with uh, with Kid Rock. Oh, OK, that's true. Thank you. He was Kid Rock was a Republican. Um, but the point is, is that it was not seen that there were you couldn't be a conservative. We were in a very different place. We th it's. Kanye's kind of, if you want to call it a, his red pilling, it happens in a moment in our country when, you know, there's enormous social pressure on anyone who expresses opinions that are 
in any way deviating from what are seen as like almost moral imperatives in a way where it wasn't before. Where it was like it was okay. Like they're, they're cool people in the culture, cultural elites were not Republicans or conservatives in 2005. But nobody cared if you were making a movie and there was an actor who you knew to be a conservative was on. You know what I'm saying? There wasn't pressure yeah. that was brought to bear. Or if, Kevin you know I mean? Sorbo had not yet been fully blacklisted by Hollywood. Yeah, or like, you know, remember, I mean, Mark Stein was a was a staff writer for The Atlantic. And nobody cared because it was it was understood that you could have, you know, yeah, not everyone's gonna agree. And so he can so he he says that about Hurricane Katrina. He doesn't really become this gadfly until that we have this change in the culture where certain people think that words are violence and that we have to deplatform people who have you know, political views that are harming people and things like that. That's when I think something clicks with Kanye. Mm -hmm. um, and also it's, it's possible, it's quite possible that his, his, uh, his bipolar uh, issues yeah. worsened uh, and maybe they, they, they're sometimes manageable and then he's not taking medicine and they're worse. So that might be an explanation too. I want to just add one more thing. Wouldn't it be perfect from a kind of cultural karma for George W. Bush at an award show to say Kanye West doesn't like Jewish people? Wouldn't that be like the perfect symmetry at this point? Anyway. I don't know. You know, I uh, that's a, it's a great plan, but what awards program is going to invite George W. Bush? Oh yeah, the, I, I mean, the, maybe the, like the, the Saudi the, Arabian the, Khashoggi the Awards or something. Democracy uh, Anti Disinformation yeah. Awards with like the good um, folks let's of Let's run. Let's run. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is true that. Uh, Bush, who left office, I think, with the lowest approval ratings. Uh, he had lower approval ratings than when Nixon left. Is that true? Um, yeah. And, um, you know, started climbing in the public imagination or in the public memory as Trump, you know, was uh, was soldiering on as president. Um, so all of this. There's a little bit of a precedent here, too, where it's it's about the the the, the craziness of our particular moment, because, you know, Bowie in the late 70s yeah. got in trouble for fascist iconography. Eric oh, Clinton, and also for literally saying something, and this is a paraphrase, yeah. but it's pretty close, that fascism is the only proven effective form of government. Okay, I mean, he right. was, so, yeah. So he was saying that, and it's not like people said, I'm not going to buy scary monsters. And then, right. um, you know, Eric Clapton famously, yeah. you know, had that crazy speech where he... <laughs> endorsed Enoch Powell, who is this, you know, reactionary anti-immigration and, and that kind of, th those kinds of politics. And, you know, there was rock against racism where people, you know, wanted to, but it wasn't like Eric Clapton was ostracized and said, you know, we're never going to no. like play your music again, because that's not, because we had an, an appreciation in the 70s and the 80s and the, that there were going to be, that artists could have extreme points of view, but it didn't affect the quality of their art and you know, we weren't going to go that far. It's only now that these are live issues again, which is crazy. It's like we're 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 back to the Anthony Comstock era. Um, but that so let's let's go deep on this yeah, a yeah. little bit. Uh, you know, because you know, this is the question then, right? Uh, you know, should you separate the artist from the art, or at what what level do you, or at what point do you? Because I think we all do. Um, you yeah, know, we have to, right? Um, so what is your sense? How close does, uh, you know, how close are we to having that happen now? And I think you're right to say we're, you know, the cultural moment has changed since, you know, whatever we are in 2022. It's different yeah. than it was in 2002. Um, and it's kind of refreshing to remember that, um, you know, that yeah. and it's different than 82 or 62 or whatever. But, you know, Natalie, would you I mean, like, are any of the things that Kanye is saying, and like, I, I would not even consider like, oh, you know, he's pro-Trump, so I won't listen to his music. That seems nuts. Um, the anti-Semitic stuff and some of the other things he's talked about are a little bit worrying and also indications of a kind of delusional mo uh, mode that he's in. You know, he's also talked about becoming president and it's not clear that he is either joking or speaking figuratively. Um, and I'm uncomfortable, you know, kind of, consuming work by people who seem to be obviously insane. Um, but I mean, Natalie, has he, you know, when, when, what would he have to do to cross the line for you? Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to give him any ideas. Um, mm. okay. <laughs> so, but part of it, I think, 
part of it is like, of course, I'm going to, it's personal preference. And in my opinion, like, I don't, I don't care if someone, if you're an actor, if you're a singer and you have a specific political party that you agree with and you make that public, like good for you. Like, I don't have to agree with your politics to listen or dance to your music. Um, But I do think it gets to a line where it's, it's too hard to separate. Like you were just saying, it's too hard to separate the performer and their work um, from their like personal antics. And um, I think it's it's very clear, and Nick and I were discussing this beforehand, but it, it's very clear to me, and especially with the, uh, the unaired clips that um, Vice pulled out as well, that um, Tucker Carlson was trying to show a, a Kanye that looked like he should be a conservative, conservative icon. Um, but then in the extra bits from the interview that we saw, he, you know, he's very erratic in some of his answers. Um, he said even some even like very offensive, um, anti-Semitic, uh, phrases. And I just think it's, I almost felt, I felt almost like scummy going back and rewatching the interview in the sense that like, I now have like the context I didn't originally have that the Tucker Carlson show chose to cut out. Now, does that have anything to do with me liking Kanye's music? Um, do I think that he should, like, I guess it was reported yesterday. Do I think that he should no longer be able to hold his money at JP Morgan because of this? Right. Um, and those types of like extra, like uh, the woke mob clearly coming for him. Um, I think that's a different question, but I do think, I do think him supporting Trump, isn't isn't crossing the line of like oh we should no longer listen to his music or we should shun him uh, mm-hmm. but i do think he's he's towing a line but but i think you can't forget about the other like personal mental illness problems that are going on in his life um, what do you, eli what about you uh, is there uh you know what's the rubicon uh what's well, the I, I mean, I, river I, of the I, river I that is foaming with blood that he needs to cross if, if you go historically, Ezra Pound was an open supporter of the Nazis during World War II. And uh, actually, Reagan. he preferred Mussolini, his propaganda. Fair enough. You're right. Uh, okay. were specifically but he was an in, open in, fascist in the, in the, in the yeah. great battle against the fascists. He yeah. had a radio programs, which were horrible. And uh, right. does that take away from the brilliance of his poetry? Of course not. Um, but does you, it make you more or less likely? I mean, uh, have you? when's the last time you cracked open the Cantos? Well, okay, I mean, doesn't so it tip you I'm to be like, like why I'm... Doing a little bit of a deep dive on James Jesus Angleton, who had a relationship okay. with him. So it was yeah. on the front of my mind. But that said, my point here is only that you can just you if you if you start playing this game, you're just you're going to find that great contributors to human culture are going to be off limits. So you should you should be aware of that. And so, as I say, it's very important to separate the art from the artist. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that there is a potential with Kanye because I don't know that these are strongly held beliefs. It's hard to get inside of his head. But I think there's a possibility where if you take an example of somebody like uh, Abe Foxman, famously um, kind of privately approached Jesse Jackson in 1984 after Jesse Jackson had made really anti-Semitic remarks. I mean, famously called New York Jaime Town. He you know, defended Louis Farrakhan, things like that. And it took a while, but eventually Foxman was able to sort of change, help to change Jesse Jackson's heart through appealing to him and talking to him. I don't see why you couldn't have, you know, a Barry Weiss or somebody like that today on these Jewish issues and saying, this is why it's really offensive to Jewish people or me, I don't know, someone to kind of meet with him and say, you know, I know you said this stuff and I'm not trying to cancel you. I'm not trying to go after you. I'm trying to say, do you really think this? Because, you know, I really love your music and there is a way that maybe you can, I, I don't see this as somebody who has deeply held beliefs. Now, I want to address one other thing though on this, which is let's steal man it from the other side. Uh, in this day and age of celebrity culture, someone like Kanye West has, you know, what, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people who listen to his music and really look up to him. And the argument would be that when he says it's okay, uh, when he gives, he gives a certain legitimacy to classic anti-Semitic tropes or yeah. conspiracy theories, and that is dangerous because he's got so many people who adore him for his music. My response to that is you have a very low opinion of Kanye West fans, which is to say that you don't think that Kanye West fans, or at least a, most of them, can distinguish between goofy stuff that he says, whether it's offensive or just crazy, and his music. Do you think that 
music fans are automatons and they're waiting for like, you know, the secret instructions. And then you're going to have 50 million people who are anti-Semitic. That's nuts. I don't think that's how life works. I don't think how celebrity culture really works. And while it might be that there's some people who feel that this is a permission structure, I think it's probably a slim minor slim minority of it. I, 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 I uh, you know, sort of raised this earlier this morning when I had a haircut in, in my barber shop, and I said, well, what do people think of all this stuff? Because, you know, it's not just the anti-Semitic stuff. You had the White Lives Matter, all this other thing. Yeah. And everyone's like, you know, the, the, the general consensus in my barber shop was he's lunching, but it doesn't change the fact that his music is really great. You know, yeah, of course, he says that. He's a crazy artist. It happens. And I would imagine most people probably think that way. But it is important to sort of understand that when you have somebody with that much cultural pull, that it, it, it can mainstream, you know, ideas that should be fringe and, and, uh, and you know, quarantined, I suppose. If, uh, you know, one thing to uh, think about with that, too, Eli, is that people will say that about music stars uh, yeah. in a way that they don't about, say, novelists or poets. Like, mm. you know, the argument against Ezra Pound, who obviously was never popular in the way that Kanye West is popular, but we can talk about somebody like Alice Walker, whose sure. Color Purple is probably a book that you know, as many Americans are as alive, have read The Color Purple as have read any other novel. I mean, you know, it's right. a major, major work. She has trafficked in anti-Semitic, uh, you know, tropes herself, uh, as well as is a, a believer of David Icke, uh, the former soccer, you know, soccer player announcer turned a uh, theorist of a grand conspiracy of lizard people, including the royal family of England, as well as uh, Dana Perino at Fox News and other assorted gems, are really running the planet while mass, you know, while hiding right. their true lizard quality. But very few people would say you shouldn't read *The Color Purple* or even other things that Alice Walker has said. Uh, you know, we we attribute a lot more intelligence to non-music fans. Um, it's a really it, great point, yeah. Yeah. You know, and and to a certain degree, maybe movie stars, but even them, not as much. And that's a kind of fascinating thing, which I hadn't really thought about until you were talking about this, because we don't, um, you know, we don't we don't go after you know high class people. Um, you know, uh, somebody like Gertrude Stein had many many kind things to say about the uh, Patan regime. Uh, the Vichy collaborationist regime of which she was a guest, um, you know, during World War II. And that's only recently come to light in literary studies where people are grappling with the fact that Stein in certain ways supported a regime, you know, or a political movement that also saw her as one of the great enemies of Western civilization. It gets Michel confusing. Michel Foucault celebrated the Islamic revolution in Iran. He, to his credit, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, he denounced it shortly after that. And, and I mean, you, you can, afterwards? yes, you can, okay. you can, it, you know, it's an open question as to whether or not somebody who falls for that in the first place is kind of, you know, is he worth thinking through but, uh, but, you know, certainly he's no Martin Heidegger, you know, to give another yeah. example, who was an open Nazi, never, never hit it. Uh, and, yeah. you know, people still debate like Carl Schmitt, the effect right. of that. Yeah. So, no, no. I mean, that, that's an interesting question. And I am, you know, what seems to be a little bit different now, um, and this might be a positive thing, because in the 90s, and, you know, I started at Reason in 93, and, and that was a decade where liberals and conservatives, but especially people like Hillary Clinton, were attacking, uh, and Janet Reno, uh, the Clinton administration more broadly, were attacking um, cable TV and music for its pernicious effects in video games, which were emerging as a kind of art form and a very popular entertainment form. They attacked them from the specific grounds that you were saying, Eli, you know, that people watch them and they do what they see, that audiences are essentially, you know, trained monkeys who you know they see yeah. something on the tv and they go out and do it um i think it might be a positive sign that we're not talking about this in you know quite in these terms i don't think people are saying uh, uh kanye west is legitimizing anti-semitic violence it's just i don't want to listen to that guy because he's an anti-semite and that's by the way if an individual if a jewish person or somebody who is offended by any I mean, of you if that's what you decide that's fine I mean, I don't think that that's like, I'm not going to necessarily be critical. I do think that, you, you, you know, that there's, we, we've covered why that's a problem. If I do. You're consistent I, in that view. 
I do think too, like a lot of the time, like this, I think it was back in 2019, uh, Nick Cannon was also like yeah. received like uh, the same kind of pushback that Kanye is getting now for some anti-Semitic uh, quotes. And then of course um, this happened to Dave Chappelle too. Um, he had, he said, our, I think it, it was part of his Netflix special that, you know, was controversial for other reasons as well. Um, and I think they all addressed it in other ways of like, oh, I need, I need to learn more. I need, I like, I will, I will be better next time. I just, I'm not convinced. I don't think I, Dave Chappelle did that. No, no, no. That's what Nick Cannon did. Not Dave Chappelle. Yeah, 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 right, I'm, I'm right. just, I'm not, I'm not convinced that Kanye is going to do that. Um, I think, right. I think part of it too, is that like this all stemmed from like his interview on Tucker was after the, he wore the white lives matter shirt at Paris mm -hmm. fashion week. Uh, last week with uh, Candace Owens, um, which she 100% knew was going to be provocative and yeah. uh, going to be controversial. Let's um, let's run the clip, him talking about why white lives matter, yeah. um, and then we'll pick up the conversation. All right. Uh, wearing the hat. I had a, a, someone call me last night and said, anybody wearing a white lives matter shirt is going to be green lit, and that means that they're going to beat them up if they wear it. And I'm like... You know, okay, green light me then. Subscribe to the Fox News YouTube. So he just, he was receiving uh, obviously a ton of backlash for wearing that at uh, Paris Fashion Week. And of course, Candace Owens came to his defense on Twitter. Um, but there was like so many events that just like cascaded off of that. Um, so it was the White Lives Matter t-shirt. Then it, um, I believe it was, he uh, posted tweets or no, posted text messages from Diddy um and about diddy wanted to like meet with kanye face to face and have a conversation about the white lives matter t-shirt um they go way back and then uh kanye just like kind of spiraled from there then got invited onto tucker um and i think given given all the context like i don't necessarily think this is someone that's like oh like we can change his mind or he, like he'll learn in the long run. Um, not that I don't say that's for everyone, but Kanye, I'm just not convinced yeah. that like from Eli's, uh, like what Eli was saying earlier, that he's going to like, we can like alter his mind by like making him learn more. Well, um, let's, I, mean, like, I mean, just yeah. like it's oftentimes if you want to change someone's mind, you don't do it in a public way where you try to get clout oh. for criticizing yeah. them. You meet with them privately and you kind of try to, you try to connect with somebody on a human level. And that's far more effective in dealing with an individual celebrity who says terrible things um, versus, you know, what we do now, which is that there's a whole bunch of people who are rushing to kind of cancel somebody and make sure that, you know, we no longer celebrate them. And, and the whole idea, we're going to deplatform them in the Internet era. I mean, that makes no sense, yeah. you know, but OK, fine. Why don't we uh, let's run the. Yeah. Um anti-Semitism clip that we have, Natalie, yeah. and then come back to the conversation. And yeah. this is Kanye talking to uh, Tucker again and where he gets into a kind of classic uh, anti-Semitic trope. Yeah, uh, and that, also this was this is one of the clips that was not aired on, it was got cut out of the Tucker interview. Right. Um, so Vice had picked it up. Planned Parenthood was made by Margaret Sanger, a known eugenics, with the KKK to control the Jew population. When I say Jew, I mean the 12 lost tribes of Judah, the blood of Christ, who the race, the people known as the race black really are. This is who our people are, the blood of Christ. This as a Christian is my belief. And I believe that if we saw ourselves as more Uh, do you want to uh, burrow into that a little bit, Eli? Uh, yeah, what is the like, what's what's he a, getting at? First of all, isn't it always the case that like, there's like a little bit of true fact mixed in with a bunch of bullshit? Like it's always like that's how conspiracy theories work. Because it is true that Margaret Sanger really was concerned about minority populations, and like that's that's a real thing. There were a whole bunch of progressives at the beginning of the 20th century that embraced eugenics from a kind of, you know, per, we're doing it for their own good kind of perspective. And that was really awful. And we denounce it today. And it was part of, you know, I, I will rush to point out that uh, Margaret Sanger, though, herself uh, was very anti-abortion. She believed yes. in contraception, but not abortion. And it's 
kind of fascinating to me, you know, that Planned Parenthood claims her in one way, um, even though she was anti-abortion and conservatives hate her, even though she was anti-abortion. Well, that's a very good crazy point. mixed up world. No, that's, but I'm saying that like, this is like, you know, this was yeah. also, this is the same tree that gave us like kind of scientific racism and, right. you know, social Darwinism and all these ideas that are now been discredited, but it was a thing that was, you know, it's part of our history. And then, of course, he layers on top of that uh, fiction and fantasy, and, and it is an anti-Semitic trope. It's not one, as a Jew, that I have to tell you that I am, you know, it's not on the top of my list of concerns because it is so nutty. And the mainly the people who believe it are the, like, you know, the black Israelites who you see at, mm -hmm. you know, Union Station or something. At I mean, the uh, Lincoln Memorial causing, it, uh, there causing you go. all kinds right, of exactly. problems. Like it's, yeah. it's, so it's... You know, and you have to. And the I, Nation of Islam, certainly Louis Farrakhan is trafficked in that quite a bit. And I can remember, as I'm sure you do, Eli, yeah. a, a particular moment in the mid 90s when uh, I think it was Khalid Sheikh, Mo not Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Khalid Mohammed, who was affiliated with the Nation of Islam, gave a speech where he talked about, uh, you know, bagel eating, hook nosed, yeah, so called Jews oh. at Kane College. And he would refer to it. Uh, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani, the mayor of New York, as Adolf Giuliani yeah. and whatnot, okay. um, and got cashiered, got cashiered out of yeah. the Nation of Islam because of that. Yeah. So listen, that's these are kind of deplorable ideas. But again, um, I do think that sometimes we have a problem in our society of what I call like the weak fascist problem, which is to say when there are minority groups that don't have real cultural, economic, or political power, but have deplorable and terrible ideas um we, we we have to make a distinction between that and then like you know jim crow south of when you have powerful local government institutions that are that are driven by a certain kind of racist ideology so again i am like more concerned with the official state ideology of iran that wants a nuclear weapon than i am with a bunch of you know so-called black israelites who believe a bunch of garbage about you know the lost tribes of israel and so forth well can i ask then i mean yeah. that's that's really provocative and by the way if uh you know that it, it that kind of informs my critique of um of to kill a mockingbird which is a novel which is always celebrated but it strikes me you know what what to kill a mockingbird does is it ends up putting the onus of of uh segregation in the south on the backs of poor whites, you know, who yeah. are incestuous, et cetera. They didn't have power. It was the power elite. It was the Atticus Finches of the world and everybody he piled around with who were the problem in the South, you know, ultimately because they held power. So I, I like the way that you're talking about weak fascists. We build up people who don't have the kind of power because they're easy pickings and, I mean, and we can I kind of be, slay is, them. Get, it's, it's, it's related to this, but I mean, one of the reasons why I am not on the like, emergency of democracy and like once i think january 6th was terrible yeah but january 6th was largely a problem you had one guy the president who did try to steal an election which is horrible yeah. but then all the people who are being punished who show up at the capitol who think they're actually going to overturn the election are the disenfranchised they have no real power and they're yeah. that's an example of kind of like the weak fascism and like to treat them like Al Qaeda after 9-11, I think is a category error, which we're doing right now. So, so then let me ask yeah. though, I, I, I thank you. That's, I think that's a, a great insight. What kind of power does Kanye West have? You know, and he doesn't have the power of Bull Connor or, you know, something no. he's not going to be setting dogs loose on Jews or, you know, white people or Taylor Swift fans or anything like that. But doesn't he have some kind of cultural power or how, how do we measure the influence that, you know, that he has or artists like him? Uh, well, because we he, want to admit, I yeah. mean, we don't, we don't want to confuse them, you know, with, you know, with people with guns and badges necessarily, but, you know, aren't they unacknowledged legislators of the world as, uh, you know, Shelley talked about poets. I mean, what, what is his cultural power then? And Natalie, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think Kanye has a, a like a significant amount of social capital, right? Um, and obviously his power comes through, th um, through social capital. And even like uh, briefly, I think it was yesterday I was looking this up, but um, he, he might not be, he's obviously not getting celebrated for these comments on Twitter, but apparently 4chan and like some of, and some of those other sites are like blowing up about how he is like, uh, like a conservative icon because of these comments, not because of like his support for Trump, but because of these comments. So there are like, there are bigoted people 
that hmm. like see this as validation um, for their beliefs. And he and that's where he's pulling a lot of that social capital. Um, now, do I think like do I think he is like is dangerous? Like like well, to the level that like Eli was saying with like some of his other examples. No. Um, but I think at the same time, like this man very much believes he will be president in his lifetime. He said that it like in the Tucker Carlson interview. And like, you know, we, we said he's going, he's clearly going through, um, a tough battle with mental illness and whether there's debates or wh whether or not he's like, you know, that has highs and lows and whether he's in a high right now. Um, but I think like someone who that is that sure they're going to be president in their lifetime. Well, one, someone who wants to be president period is you know, uh, <laughs> always questionable, but, right. um, I think that, I think he has a lot more social capital than people are giving him credit for because they're, they're writing him off as crazy. Yeah. Um, mm. Does that, well, uh, can we separate point. out? Yeah. Can we separate out the idea that like, he's crazy because he likes Trump, which seems to be part of what's going on, or he's crazy because he is struggling with bipolar disorder and has you know in the past acknowledged such um i mean one of the things that i find and i i don't know that there's any meaningful way to disentangle this but like it bothers me that we at times increasingly it seems we're willing to pathologize people's political beliefs um you know and and not simply say you're wrong but like you're nuts um, right i mean i think i think among especially among i uh, younger people in general, mental health is like, is a really important thing that a lot of politicians probably aren't taking as seriously as they should, especially as my generation and the generation below me gets, yeah. gets a little bit older. Um, it's, it's in the forefront of like all, all, all of the polls are like for younger people under 25, the biggest concern they have is, you know, mental health, like taking care of their mental health, yeah. mental health illnesses, not having enough like support in, you know, in college and high school, whatever, um, to treat mental health problems. Um, so I think it's, I, I certainly, I, I do not think he's crazy because he support, he likes Donald Trump. Um, I, but I do think there, there needs to be some, some, like, I don't know if it's like an asterisk or a caveat or what, um, that hit just because he believes some things that people, you know, on the left or even on the right think it, think is crazy. It can't all be attributed to his mental illness. Um, and I think mental health is like a big problem. We, and clearly in the unedited clips, we saw there are some things that like even Tucker Carlson didn't think were, uh, yeah. let's say, uh, kosher enough to show. Um, That's a loaded term when you're talking I, about Kanye West. I know. Uh, let's, let's, I want to go uh, in, in, in just a second to the question about journalism. Like, are there questions about how journalism is practiced, particularly by Tucker Carlson? Uh, you know, in 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 light of this interview and particularly the stuff he left out. But before we leave this mental health question, Natalie, what what do you think explains? You're absolutely right that, you know, all polls show that younger millennials and Gen Z people, are, you know, mental health is the concern that comes up again and again in every context, in every survey and every poll. Why is that? Because I got to tell you, I mean, like, and, you know, and I say I have, I have a son who's 28, one who's 21. So it's not like I'm, I'm not talking to people of in that age cohort. But like, why is mental health so front and center? Because, you know, from where I'm sitting, I mean, there are many, many problems in the world, but it looks pretty fucking good compared to 30 years ago, certainly 60 or 80 years ago. I think I think a big part of it, Nick, is that it's just it's much more uh, destigmatized than it used to be. Um, so like the idea of like, you know, going to therapy or the idea of like actually talking with someone you love and respect over like stuff you're struggling over is much less stigmatized than it used to be. Um, and I do think like there is more of an emphasis at, um, in schools to kind of like, especially after the COVID years and, um, isolation to kind of make sure you're prioritizing, you know, yourself and your mental health. Um, and I think when it was such on display, with Kanye, I think it was like, not that it was triggering, um, but I think it was like, oh, you know, maybe there should be, there should be someone that like, I don't know if it steps in or like, I don't, I don't necessarily think like, I think Tucker was almost using, like, it was very clearly to me that he was like using Kanye um, in what seemed like a vulnerable moment. 
um, and then kind of like use it to his advantage, especially, I mean, like Nick said earlier, what they cut out almost says more than what the, what the actual interview did. Um, so I think, I, I think it's just like, I think it's a much bigger, I wouldn't say it's more rampant, like mental illness or like people struggling with their mental health. I would just say it's, um, it's talked a lot about more, uh, talked about more yeah. in public than it used to be. Eli, you recently became a, a parent for the first time. Uh, do you look yes. forward to a world in which, you know, mental health continues to deteriorate? Um, no. Uh, and I'm worried that we created these amazing devices, which are important, you know, like smartphones and social media platforms and so forth. But I think they also sort of make us more miserable. And so I, it is, it is, it's a, it's, it is like this double-edged sword you know, on the one hand, Natalie, your your generation should be delighted if you take the long view. You know, I mean, we just had a plague and in less than a year we came up with a vaccine. You know, I'm sure, you know, people who suffered from the bubonic variety a thousand years ago would, would love to trade places with us. On the other hand, I do think that we're kind of, it's like um, the obesity problem in this country you know, we are a species that's designed to crave fat and sugar because when we were living in, you know, the wild, and, you know, trying to hunt and gather for our meals, when we came across such things, it was important because we may not know what our next meal is. And now that we've figured out how to make ourselves happy and eat what we like, we've created a new set of problems. And I do think that there's, there's some of that as well. Uh, you know, the other thing that I would add to this um, is I do think that we are pathologizing everyday life in a way that is distinct. And this is fundamentally a, a byproduct of wealth. Um, you know, yeah, you have Prosper, more mental you have more mental problems when you have more choices and more options, including not to work. And I'm not minimizing the struggles that people have, but um, I think one of the most important books of the past 50 years um, is Christopher Lash's The Minimal Self, which was kind of mm -hmm. sequel to his book, The Culture of Narcissism. And he talks about, you know, psychic, psychic struggles in an age of diminishing expectations. And he was talking primarily about the late 70s and a kind of long slide in, um, in the post-war era into stagflation and into malaise and whatnot. Um, and I think it's actually even more appropriate now, but I, I am struck by the number. I have a, a lot of friends who are therapists and counselors, and even they start to talk about like basic um, kind of adolescent rites of passage, not as something that everybody goes through, but rather as traumas that need to be taken care of in a way that is very distinct from how I grew up. And I, I would not wish my childhood, which I think was very typical, very modal, for a very late baby boomer. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It was a, a life that was filled or a, a, a moment that was filled with a lack of empathy and a lack of interest in people's interior lives and all of that. Uh, very intolerant of difference and individualism in profound mm -hmm. ways. But I think we may have gone too far in a different direction where it's like, you know, every disappointment that is part of growing up has become a trauma that needs to be treated. And Natalie, to your point, I think not only have we destigmatized mental uh, mental health uh, issues, which is good, we've also probably created a lot more because there is so much more money flowing into kind of therapy and help. And Lash talks about how even people like Viktor Frankl, who wrote uh, Man's Life for Meaning uh, or Man's Search for Meaning after uh, surviving a concentration camp, that he that somewhere in the post-war era, the concentration camp experience actually became kind of a, a paradigm from which to view everyday life. And he has this brilliant uh, kind of uh, passage in The Minimal Self where he talks about how everybody started talking about themselves as survivors, which was a term that was originally, uh, you know, uh, d signified only people who had survived death camps. And then suddenly it was you know, if you uh, if you escape from Mormonism, you were a survivor. If you did this, you were a survivor, et cetera. And we still hear that rhetoric. And I think we need to, you know, kind of have a recalibration of what is actually traumatic and what is simply life as we know it. You know, yeah, I, I, I just if I could, I think it's useful if you're if you're a, a Generation Z person and you're feeling a lot of anxiety. You know, in, in instead of you know, kind of you know, thinking about 
the therapist or taking time off, take some time and get a book out about the siege of Stalingrad mm -hmm. or watch a documentary like Showa and then appreciate the sort of extremes of the human condition. And that might have an effect of sort of making you feel like, you know what, maybe I don't have it so bad. Mm. Yeah. I think a big t thing too that we didn't really touch on yeah. um, in this aspect is that like our lives are as, you know, pr as private or as public as we want to make them. And that's how yeah. like all celebrities live their lives as well. Um, yeah. So I think that's a big change too, is that, you know, we're seeing we're the Kanye West of 2005. We didn't have, I mean, we had tabloids, but we didn't have like uh, instant access to him on Twitter and like his stream of consciousness at 2 AM that he was tweeting. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a big difference too. And like, uh, I think another thing that, you know, makes it a little different. Like I do think there is some credence to what Nick was saying in the sense that like, we have, we gone too far about addressing like uh, younger, younger children's mental health or like, do we need to uh, take a step back? Cause that's like, that's a big thesis and the coddling of the American mind. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and how um, the younger generations aren't like, we're still kind of seeing the effects of them, uh, you know, being coddled. Um, right. and, yeah. and I think, you know, I had, uh, I grew up the youngest of four. Like I, I, I had a great, I have a great family and I have, I was lucky to have very supportive parents. And I think, that goes a lot further um, and goes a lot further than trying to like address these issues, uh, you know, uh, broadly or like yeah. through social media than anything else. I, I think you raise a lot of points. And, you know, one of the reasons we might not have heard from Kanye for a while, particularly even if he was seething about not being able to talk about his support for Donald Trump, ironically, was Kim Kardashian, his you know, his wife, who has since said, you know, like, uh, you know, it's hard living with a guy who's struggling with this, uh, with bipolar. But she's one of the change agents as well, who really has taken a personal life and, you know, aired everything. And it's obviously it's curated. She's in charge of most of the messages she's sending. But that's you a radically different world. Yeah, well, she thinks she is. And, you know, and it's <laughs> fascinating when you think about somebody like her who emerges into the public consciousness through a sex tape. And then becomes, you know, I, the Kardashians, keeping up with the Kardashians is back on Netflix now or Hulu uh, for a new, you know, set of uh, runs. This, it's a different world than we were in, you know, certainly 20 years ago uh, or even 20 years ago, much less 40 or 50 years ago. Um, let's, uh, and I would also recommend people, you know, The Coddling of the American Mind is a, is a really fascinating and important book. One criticism I would have of is that it, it seemed to start blaming students. And like it starts with that moment really at Yale in what was it, 2014, when a bunch of, you know, and, and uh, Greg Lukianoff and yeah. Jonathan Haidt say, you know, what changed was for a long time, the administrators of colleges and universities were pushing stuff on kids. They were pushing speech codes and restrictions. And then suddenly what flipped was that the students were demanding it. And it turned into a kind of like red guard moment where, young revolutionaries were silencing the adults. I don't doubt that. I mean, I think that's accurate, but it also kind of uh, mitigates the role that adults played in creating this. And I would recommend people read Carla Vermeulen's Generation Disaster, uh, which talks about people born between 1990 and 2001 and the messages that they have been getting since in utero of you know that the environment is destroyed the planet is dead and over you're going to be shot at, at a school shooting you're going to be kidnapped you're going to be killed by islamic terrorists the financial system has collapsed the housing market has collapsed there are no jobs anymore donald trump is evil and then COVID, and it's a really interesting look at the overall cultural messages that are not coming from younger people they're being pushed that's the you know, the media, that's the water people are swimming in. And it fills, it's a very good compliment to uh, to the coddling of the American mind. Let's, in, in the last bit that we have together here, let's talk about the question of journalism that is raised by the Tucker Carlson um, interview. Uh, and I guess, uh, Natalie, let's go to, to you first on this. You know, when you look at what was aired, and, you know, when I first looked at the the interview, I thought, you know, Kanye, for the most part, he seemed very low, you know, he was very loquacious and interesting and engaged and kind of smart and, and winning in many ways. Then when you look at the outtakes, you're like, wow, this is 
like really heavily and clearly edited in order to lose the crazy. Um, does that present a, a journalistic ethics question or, or is this just more of like, you know, a caveat lector, let the reader beware. You know, we always know we're being played, but you know, what's your takeaway on that? I mean, I do think, I do think there is a valid conversation going on about like whether or not that interview should have been aired at all. If they cut out some of the, uh, after seeing some of the parts that were cut out. Um, I, but I mean, I personally think, Tucker knew and the Tucker's team knew that they were going to get a provocative interview and like, that's what they wanted. And they, I think, I don't think this is right, but they just kind of like were, didn't necessarily care about Kanye's state of being. Um, and to them, I mean, the more or not, I guess not the more crazy, but the more like provocative and thought provoking that he was, the better it was for them. Um, I do think that is a little bit, I think that's vicious. Um, I do think he, I do think Kanye was used um, in that, in that regard. Uh, I also think, I think it was totally okay. Some people are saying that, you know, the vice over uh, motherboard over at vice shouldn't have um, published the uh, unedited clips. I completely disagree. I think they should publish them because it gave us context. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a very important context and it was more honest than the Carlson uh, show was was being. Um, and I, I, I do see the argument that they're like, oh, well, by, by Vice publishing that, it's just like perpetuating the problem and that kind of thing. But that was context that I think everyone needed um, to know like the grounds and when that interview went down. Because the way Tucker painted it was like, oh, we only asked for a 30 minute interview and we got two hours of great footage. Like he touted like the that in the very beginning yeah. of the show. Um, and that's not at all how it appeared to went, went down. I mean, even in some of the unedited clips, Kanye said like controversial things and then like was clearly like rambling and like flustered and then was like, actually, can you edit that out? Like he was clearly frustrated tr trying to find his words. Um, right. And I think that gave incredible context. And I, and I think it was totally OK um, for Vice to publish that stuff because, uh, I mean, Carlson was never going to admit to that being being the situation. Eli, as a uh, journalist, uh, you look upon this and do you despair <laughs> like Ozymandias or? Uh... No, um, TV, this is this this goes on in TV interviews all the time, especially when you're talking about celebrities as opposed to politicians. But it happens with politicians, too. There'll be two hours or three hours of raw material. You have to cut it down, you know, because we're not talking about the Internet now. We're talking about an actual show that only has, you know, an hour of a time slot i guess i'm not that surprised i'm totally with you natalie that uh it's okay to that you know the more the better um it's probably good that the world sees the um nuttier parts that were left on the cutting room floor because i think it does give a fuller picture of you know this is this is where kanye is at right now in his life and i do think that, that actually in a weird way mitigates the anti-semitic stuff that he said. So, you know, it's important everybody should denounce that, wow, that's a really crazy theory that the people who call themselves Jews are not Jews. That's really wrong. It's anti Semitic. Don't do it. Okay, fine. But it's again, like, I just think that most people who like Kanye West's music can distinguish between his music and then, like, what he is saying, even if he has delusions of grandeur that he will be president one day. Um, I just think most people kind of can see it for themselves. Maybe I'm, you know, whistling past the graveyard. Maybe I'm being panglos here and I should be more upset as a Jewish person about anti-Semitism. But I just can't, I'm not going to, you know, I think what he said is terrible, but, you know, it's also, we have all the context now and we understand that this, he's going through, he's going through it. He's going through it right now. He's going through a tough time, I think. Yeah. He he believes things that are not you know real. He's maybe having a at times a little bit of a break from reality. I mean, and it's also important. I think it's important to note too that like there have been all these articles that have come out since this interview trying to like assess his mental state. Yeah, and that's awesome. like all of these uh, doctors in to be like, well, this is could be what he's experiencing, or this is what but living with bipolarity is like. And uh, I mean, it ultimately comes down to like everyone's like psychiatric state is their own and they're all different. Everyone experiences it manifests differently. Yeah. Manic breaks manifest differently. And I think like 
okay, if you're you're going to try and help people understand why Kanye might be saying some of this stuff and he might be like acting erratic and all yep. those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think those articles certainly help. But I think at, like when it ultimately, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, he's the only one that hopefully understands the mental state that he's in and hopefully, you know, working on, working on himself just like all of us are. But I think like, so, like we even, we didn't touch on this yet, but there was like a comment he made about him believing that, you know, fake children were put into his house to um, like, or like, I guess fake friends of his children were put into his house to like influence his children. Um, and there was like just some other like really disturbing things that I, I you just like, you're like wow, like it, it, it illuminated how yeah. how much these are these are about. hallmarks of a of yeah. a kind of paranoia and delusion yeah. that often goes along with something like bipolar or mania, uh, in a, in an older formulation. I think that's right, I, and and I think that's correct. I would I just would recommend for people watching this. Freddie DeBoer has written about mm -hmm. specifically Kanye, but also read Freddie's own personal accounts of his bipolar disorder and what yeah. he had to go through. Um, I mean, I, I think Freddie is a great writer, even though I disagree when I, even when I disagree with him, he's, he's a socialist, but, um, I think he's a terrific writer and he writes really well about his own bipolarity yeah. and his own, his own mental health issues. And, you know, it's fair to say that when you're in the grips of something like that, you're not yourself. I think that's fair. I think that's a fair point. And it's possible that we're seeing Kanye right now, but it's not him. It's not the real Kanye. And that hopefully there are people in his life who love him and will understand that and accept that this is, you know, this is not who he is. It's not his true self. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because we, uh, you know, and this, this is a move that goes back to the beginning of time, but I know in American liter literature, it's, you know, at least from the early 1800s where we always, you know, we always insist that at this moment, we are the wisest that we will ever be and that we look at the, the near past or the distant past and say, oh, they were just benighted because they aren't as smart as us. And Natalie, to your point, like we are much more sophisticated when it comes to mental health issues. But the fact of the matter is, is that like most people don't know anything about what it means to be in the grip of like a serious mental illness. Um, and as a result, like a lot of the interpretation of it, I think, you know, veers into, you know, just a, a kind of cheap castigation or dismissal of somebody when in fact they are, you know, they are not themselves. I mean, that's a kind of profound thing to to kind of toss off, Eli, that, you know, when you are at your most manic and when you might be most prone to saying, no, this is the real me. Finally, these scales have fallen from my eyes, you know, and, right. and I know the truth. That is actually not you. And most of the time when you say that, that's a sign that you really need to check yourself in somewhere. Um, but, um, you know, we are, we'll continue to have these kinds of conversations about yeah. madness and civilization and whatnot. Um, By the way, it's and, not uncommon. I mean, I just, you know, the great jazz uh, alto saxophone player, Charlie Parker, had periods of his life where he would sort of show up in front of a mental hospital without mm -hmm. completely naked and just feel like, okay, I'm here. And, you know, the difference is that we didn't have social media in those days, but I'm sure if you caught Bird or some yeah. of these other great artists who have similar kinds of conditions, at their height of their manicness, they would probably be saying a lot of things too. And the issue really is that. It's not, oh my God, you know, the guy who made College Dropout hates the Jews. Ugh, you know. I don't think that's what it is. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's like, it's so tossed off and nutty as opposed to like there are people who spend a lot of time constructing anti-semitic conspiracies and tropes right and that's much more sinister in my view than 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 what kanye was and maybe i'm influenced because i love his music and i love his art yeah. but i really do think that there is a difference there i think there's also a difference uh in this to an earlier point in the conversation to think about how do, how do we comp, you know, rather than, uh, and obviously everybody is free to either listen to or read or watch or whatever yeah. they want or not, right? You know, there, there's no moral imperative here, but to complicate history and the failings or the proclivities of, of creators and authors. So, um, you know, somebody like Arthur Kessler, who is widely oh, yeah. regarded for, you know, writing a classic anti-communist uh, anti book, uh, Darkness at Noon, 
was a serial rapist, uh, almost certainly, and murdered his wife before committing suicide. And when you see that, I mean, one, you know, a legitimate response, I think, is to be like, you know what, I, I, I can get what's good in Kessler from somewhere else. So I'm not going to bother reading him, but it complicates uh, things. There's a, uh, an Italian novelist who wrote the great anti-fascist novel, Ignazio Salone, who wrote a book called Bread and, uh, Bread and Wine. And it turned out he was a communist in Italy during uh, Mussolini, during fascism. And it turned out that he was both an agent of the Comintern, of the Soviet International. Uh, he was also informing on, on his communist you know, partisans to the fascist government and reporting to the U.S. So he was a triple agent. And he wrote this great novel, which is about <laughs> people who get sold out by, uh, you know, by uh, double agents. And it you know, it makes the work more interesting in my mind rather than less interesting if you reduce it to a kind of morality tale. Um, and Mailer I stabbed his wife. Yeah. Well, that, uh, you know, that is interesting. Like, there's not, I don't know that that complicates, you know, no, if you Mailer, read it, it makes right? Clear. Yeah. Because <laughs> he actually talks about what, what yeah. is interesting about that is, you know, he stabbed her right when he was announcing that he was running for mayor of New York. And in Louis Manan's uh, recent book, The Free World, uh, which is a cultural history of post-war America, oh, he talks that. about how like the Manan. New York yeah. intellectual sign, even people like Diana Trilling, all sided with Norman Mailer. James Baldwin said, oh, you know what, like the, the woman kind of deserved it. And that complicates things where it's yes, like, it does, Norm, yeah. you know, but but it's, you know, the history is not a morality tale. It is, you know, it's a garbage pail and you rummage through a lot of it and piece together a narrative that kind of makes sense or doesn't, depending yeah. on what you need. Um, just uh, to, I don't think we're going to get to questions, uh, but uh, just to uh, sum up, uh, Natalie, what is, uh, you know, what do you do tomorrow after this conversation and after Kanye West talking to Tucker Carlson and all that? What, you know, what's, what's your... What's what's the thing that you take that will help you live a better life tomorrow? Um, you know, I mean, I'm going to still listen to Kanye West music. I love some of his original albums. Um, it's not going to change it. But I am I'm going to, you know, look a little closer, especially like I when when you think about cultural icons that you really like love and cherish, um, you you think about like there's a whole part of them and a whole life you don't see that they have. Um, and I think it's it's inc it's important to be, you know, thoughtful about the type of the cultural icons that you love and the ones that you follow. Um, and I think this was just another like, you know, litmus test of who who you look up to. No, nope. that's kind of what I took from it. Eli, I hope uh, Kanye uh, kind of records a remix of Hatikva. That would be. <laughs> That would be like the perfect. Are you gonna rap? We're gonna rap with him. <laughs> I'm gonna rap with him. Why, why do you have to do this, Nick? Anyway, um, no, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not gonna. I, I, again, like I, I, I think we should get to this point in our culture where we're not looking at our, at our musical heroes or our artistic heroes yeah. for our political guidance or something or like you know what we think of other things. We can, we should be able to distinguish that, and I think that's the grown up position. It's like you wrote this great piece, Nick, and I, it stayed with me. That like why are we why do we want our presidents to also be our preachers like why do we want them to be our like moral exemplars right we, you know we're we're hiring them for a job so to speak and like let's let's stay in your lane like we they don't have to be all these other things and I kind of feel the same way about you know great artists or you know kind of people who are are, are celebrities like we should be we should it's part of being you know a, a, in a free society is you have to be kind of a participant and you have to be a, a grown up and not not assume that everybody else is children. I think uh, that's those are two good insights. I'll throw in mine, which is that this whole episode reminds me we live in a in a golden age of kind of forced transparency. And yeah. so the you know the the Fox News interview with Tucker Carlson is one thing, and I'm kind of glad that it, you know that it's out there. I, I don't know that you can really take advantage of a superstar like Kanye West, uh, but the the fact that Vice aired other things you know basically what has been you know over the past 20 or 50 years it's harder and harder to hide stuff but what remains after that is that people who are generally acting in good faith and are kind of honest and admit their mistakes and move on or grow you know generally do pretty well in the world and you know one of the other things is that just as as consumers and we're all consumers in you know in a media age like we're in now you need to be really um thoughtful and and 
you know, everybody needs to have media literacy cranked up to 11 because what you're seeing is never really the truth. And you always have to create the own, your own context and meaning for it. And I think this episode kind of helps, uh, you know, for sure. underscore that. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Natalie Dowzicki of Reason uh, for joining me on this live stream, as well as Eli Lake. Eli, yeah. your uh, your podcast is the yeah. Listen to the Reeducation. Yeah. Uh, where where's the best the... place to listen to it? Well, Apple. Steve, we're on all the platforms, but listen to it. We've got okay. this week. We've got uh, a great episode with Jamie Kirchick on the Lincoln Project, and the one tomorrow will be all about the sort of nuclear brinksmanship right now over Ukraine. <laughs> Vladimir Putin, it'll be a fun one. All right. Well, thank you all for watching and listening and participating. So, all right. So long. Thank See you. Ya. See you.